yeah, I guess I guess we could get started. So yeah, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're uh, happy to have Dave Ockley talking about uh, exotic families of diffeomorphisms and embedding. But, yeah, thanks. All right. Well, thanks, Matt. I'm trying to make things as normal as possible over Zoom. Or throw the keys in the corner of the room, but um, oh, why isn't this thing? Here we go. So today I'm going to talk about an aspect of the big, large difference between the smooth and uh, topological world in um, four dimensions. And so we see, for instance, that smooth concordance is very different than topological concordance. In this case, you know, some main players will be the homotopy groups of the diffeomorphism group versus the homotopy groups of the homeomorphism group for a smooth four manifold. Um, when I did a shorter version of this talk at the AMS meeting, I skipped the history pretty much entirely. I'm still gonna skip a big part of the history, but I'll at least give a sampler of some of the results. It's a given that I'm gonna skip some results that should probably be mentioned or important results in the field. But one of the very first results, of course, goes back to the uh, founder of this difference between smooth and topological worlds. Donaldson, in his early work, showed uh, that there are um, path components in the space of homeomorphisms that can't be represented by diffeomorphisms. If you think about things that move hyperbolics in a K3, you can probably figure out why that might be. Um, a number of years later, in 1998, uh, Danny uh, showed that there were um, elements in the kernel of this same map. In other words, there were diffeomorphisms on certain four manifolds uh, that could be smoothly deformed, uh, could be deformed through diffeomorphisms could not be deformed through diffeomorphisms, but could be deformed one to another through homeomorphisms. Um, at the same time, I had done a small result on stabilization of uh, the not Sugu manifolds, showing that one was enough in that case. And we understood that combining those things together should be able to produce something a little bit Higher. And so that was the genesis of this result of work that we'll be talking about more than 20 years ago. Some other results, Watanabe has been doing some really interesting work. Um, he's doing work on smaller four manifolds, for instance, on the four sphere, where gauge theory isn't, for instance, going to pick up. Um, so he states his results for a four disk with boundary, and for instance, shows that um, the ranks of these homotopy groups are uh, positive. Uh, um, in particular, you can look at the force here to sort of gluing in a four disk and see, for instance, that you've got a non-trivial kernel on the level of pi one. Um, some other really cool work is what Barglia and Kono on uh, others in this camp are doing. And so, for instance, they're showing that there is a non-trivial co-kernel in the map from pi 1 to pi 1 here on K3. And another result here that also features Kono as one of the authors is um, the fact that there is a homeo X bundle over a torus that's not smoothable. And then if you look at the obstruction theory to say, is, this tells you that as a bundle, uh, as sort of a smooth, you know, it tells you that you can't really represent this as a smooth bundle. And so this tells you that when you look at the homotopy fiber and think about the obstruction theory for the bundle, that at least one of the fundamental groups, one of the homotopy groups in this range from one up to the dimension of the torus minus one is not an isomorphism. It doesn't tell you which one it fails, and it doesn't tell you whether it fails because it fails to be injective or surjective, but it's a nice, you know, it, it's lovely work. Um, was there something else I wanted to say about this? 
Uh, I'm sure there must be things I'm forgetting. I always tend to forget stuff. Um, another result here is that um, the uh, Bain twist on the three sphere in the neck of the connect sum is topologically, but not smoothly isotopic to the identity. Uh, Peter and Tom proved this. Um, Zhen Feng then proved that even after you connect them with one S2 times S2, this result is not smoothly isotopic to the identity. Let me say exclamation point here. This is the first example where one is not enough when you're talking about a stability result in four dimensions. Usually things that are uh, exotic smoothly become uh, equivalent after you take connect thumbs, well, there's lots of theorems that say they become equivalent after you do enough connect thumbs with S2 cross S2s. In all prior known cases, one was enough. So now, oh, the thing that I was forgetting to say is all of those prior results were represented on prior talks on gauge theory virtual. So you can go back and read full on lectures. So I'll feel a little less guilty about not going into more detail there. So here are two of the theorems of the day that Ben and I want to point out to you. And so these theorems show that the kernel of the map on homotopy between diffeomorphisms and homeomorphisms is large. In fact, it can have a z mod r, and not a z mod r, a z to the r sum and in this kernel. And for any r, no matter how big you like, you can pick a manifold and get a kernel that size. And in fact, you can get that kernel in a whole range of homotopy groups, getting all of the homotopy groups at the same time with the same manifold. Um, in fact, a result that I think we, I mentioned in the AMS meeting this past weekend, but I don't think we've mentioned it prior, is that you also get the same result on the level of homology, which that result doesn't follow just from algebraic topology in the theorem above it, but the technique that we're using pretty much give it. Um, conjecturally, um, these things have an infinite rank sum and, and we even kind of have an idea of how this, how one would prove that, um, but that'll be, you know, paper number two. We need to get this paper out first. Um, also, these things all smoothly contract or conjecturally would smoothly contract after doing one stabilization. We can prove that many of the uh, things in the kernel um, contract. Um, in addition to results about diffeomorphisms, we can also get results about spaces of embeddings. And so if you look at homotopy groups from smooth embeddings of, say, a two-sphere into your manifold versus continuous embeddings, you'll have families that smoothly contract, but don't, uh, that topologically contract, but don't smoothly contract. And so now that I've stated these results, to prove them, you have to construct suitable families. And there's lots of constructions one might think about, but you've got to not only construct the families, you've got to construct them in such a way that you can compute relevant invariants that show things that work. Um, and so one of the starting points is an interesting diffeomorphism. And so let's just start out looking at the, the map from CP2 to CP2 given by complex conjugation. You could slightly tweak this by smooth isotopy to make it fit a disk so you can patch it into other things. Um, this thing I think of as a reflection. It uh, reflects the second homology, but it's an orientation preserving map. In fact, 
the same, this map doesn't depend on the orientation on CP2. So we have a similar map on CP2 bar and that uh, neighborhood, that CP2 and CP2 bar say punctured in the disk that's fixed is a neighborhood of a plus or minus one sphere. So you have these interesting diffeomorphisms in the neighborhood of any sphere of self-intersection plus one or minus one. Minus one is gonna work a little bit nicer because it'll preserve homology orientations that are part of the definition of the invariance. Um, so in fact, what you can do is instead of looking at CP2 by itself, look at CP2 plus two CP2 bars. And sitting inside there, there are a pair of spheres um, that have self-intersection negative one and um, intersect in one point. They're given by take the hyperplane class in CP2 and tube it to a copy of the exceptional class in each fiber. And when you square these, these are all orthogonal. So one minus one minus one, that's a negative one class. So it has one of these reflections. And then you can do the same thing where when you tube the last exceptional one, you tube with a negative. Uh, and so you come on the tube from the, bring the tube in from the other side. And this turns out to be a very interesting diffeomorphism. In fact, it's this point here that's going to motivate why we'll use Yang Mills theory, not Cyberg Witten or Brower Furuta right out of the blocks. And that's because when I look at the induced map by this F on spin C structures, it doesn't fix the spin C structure, which means that if you try to directly port our arguments over in Cyberg Witten or Bauer Furuta, it won't work, though there are some ideas and things to change it and tweak it and make it, which would get you stronger results. So in order to use this, we need some interesting spheres. Luckily, using banded unlinks, I can show you some interesting spheres. So if there's questions, shout them out. Um, here, what I've got is I've got a black curve tied in a knot. This is the 946 or it's the negative three, three, negative three pretzel knot. And I'm doing plus one surgery on it. And so that builds a particular four manifold. And to build the surface in it, I take this dark green curve and I take this light green curve. If you ignore everything else, that's an unlink of two components. And so those bound a pair of disks, which sits in the four ball before you even attach the black two handle on. And then when you move up in the four ball, adding a collar a little higher, you can add a band. So a one handle to the surface like this blue band. And if you then erase the center of that blue band and look at the surgery, what you're left with will be a curve that's exactly parallel to the two handle with the correct framing. And so, you can cap that off and that gives you a picture of a sphere. I might call that the left sphere with the backward R on the left side. And here the blue band looks kind of like an R. That could be the right sphere. And these are both plus one spheres. So if I then took a connected sum with a CP2 bar and a CP2 bar, I could add this sphere to both of those with tubes uh, and do the diffeomorphism F. Or I could add it to the one and subtract it, you know, put a tube going with the opposite orientation to the second. I could do the same thing over here. And so that will give me two different diffeomorphisms that I can compose together. One of the questions is, where does this appear in nature? It's actually convenient to put these in closed manifolds so you don't need to look at boundary conditions or a floor theory. And so, that's what we can look at next. So, yeah, it just looks like a kind of big picture, but let me tell you where to find it and read about it because I'm not going to tell you all and tell you some tweaks and places where it's different. This picture on the left 
is a picture of the K3 surface. This is essentially the picture in the textbook by Gumpf and Stipschitz. It's been used by other people. We've done a slight tweak of it. It's not exactly the one that appears in Gumpf and Stipschitz. The reason that I've tweaked it is so that you can keep track of this blue trefoil with this uh, negative two uh, mer framed meridian. That in fact is what's called the Gumpf nucleus. The important thing about that purple thing is I can take a ciphered surface for that purple trefoil and cap it off using the two disc that's attached when I attach the two handle with framing zero. And that gives me a natural, you know, think of it as purple porous that I can use to glue this into other manifolds. Um, so now I've added an extra negative one over here. So this is the regular holomorphic blow up of the K3 surface. And we do a few handle slides. We slide this guy over here, we slide this one around and slide it over that one like this. And then we slide the blue one over the green. And now if you just look at the red dotted circle and the blue circle, which is a two handle, and erase everything else, uh, winds three times and two times, but you can wind around like that, it turns into exactly this pick. This is actually a picture of the absolute fork, and this is where it appears in nature. Um, and another thing to recognize is if you take this crossing right here and change it, then this thing turns into the hop flame, which means that these things could cancel if you changed that crossing. And the natural way to change that crossing is if we do an anti holomorphic blow up, and so add a plus one framed unknot over here. That of course spans the ciphered surface of the unknot in the core of the two handle, so it's plus one two sphere. And you slide it through here and cancel. Once you do that, you get exactly the picture of the surface that we saw on the prior slide. That's where this comes from by that sequence of handle slides. In fact, I can flip it either direction, which that flipping it either direction is just the rotational symmetry that you see here. That rotational symmetry is the cork twist that acts non-trivially on the floor here. So far so good. So now we're gonna do some constructions. Our constructions are gonna be fairly homogeneous constructions. We're not gonna use any um, uh, non-GMO, uh, you know, farm, we're not gonna use farm to market food where you breed the vegetables. We're not gonna use any engineering. This is just sort of some old school constructions. And so if we look at this picture here, what we're seeing is the K3 surface is an elliptic fibration. So that means you've got a fibration where the base is CT1, so a two sphere that I'm just drawing is R2 here. And the generic fiber is just the torus, but at 12 special points, these um, A's and B's dots, um, projection, those are critical values of the projection map where you get a fishtail fiber, where over each one of those points, you either collapsed the B cycle down to a point or the A cycle down to a point as labeled. The reason that we like drawing it like this is we can see a number of things in this picture. One thing we can see is over this black dot, the regular fiber is just a torus. We're gonna to do fiber sums along that torus um, as we build up constructions. In fact, I could connect up with a pair of vanishing cycles. In other words, if I follow out like this, there over this point, critical point, the A cycle has collapsed to a point. And if I flow backwards, I would get a disc attached to this A cycle, um, which is called the vanishing cycle or the thimble. I'd also have a disc attached to this B cycle. So if I take a union of those things that's simply connected, if I take a section of this fibration, those things union the section is called the Gumpf nucleus. 
modern technology, you just need to know that I've got the torus to do fibrosomes on later. Though with this extra information, this is what Ron Finchel and Ron Stern call the C-embedded torus. Now over on the other side, I've got some more stuff happening. So the first thing is you can compute the monodromy when you do um, an A and a B, and you'll get a right-hand Dane twist around A and a right-hand Dane twist around B. And if you uh, compose these pairs of Dane twists alternating A's and B's, you get the trivial element, which means that when you restrict this bundle over this blue circle, it's just T2 times S1, so it's just T3. So in this T3, if I just keep track of the B cycle, that's a circle times a circle, that's a blue torus, so that gives us another torus in this picture. And this torus has some extra stuff in the middle of it. The extra stuff is representing by the symbols corresponding to these eight curves stuck into pairs. We could kind of look like, you know, I should have made one of these orange. Like I do this purple one, that's a disc attached to A like this. And then this thing, which is another disc attached to the A cycle. So this gives me a sphere and it's got self-intersection negative one from this side, negative one from this side. So this is a sphere of self-intersection negative two. And furthermore, since this diameter is going around the A cycle, when I look over here where these things might intersect, it intersects the B and I'm doing this across the B in precisely one point. And so this purple sphere is a negative two sphere that intersects the blue torus in exactly one point. The blue torus obviously has self-intersection zero because I could take a parallel copy of that blue curve. Then I've got the light blue, brown, green. So in fact, I've got four negative two spheres intersecting the torus at one point. We could even add a little bit more. If I wanted, I could add in a thimble going up to one of the Bs on the inside of this region. And I could take a section defined over the inside of that circle. And that would give me a nucleus that I'm describing over this piece and another nucleus that's described over here. Those two nuclei are two of the three nuclei sitting inside K3 that Tom and Bob describe in their um, com uh, irreducible manifolds need not be complex paper back in the 90s. Um, we only need two of those nuclei. Really, we just need two of these tori um, for one of the piece. The reason that I've got these extra negative two spheres is we can build another manifold. The way that we'll build another manifold is we'll take a fiber sum of two copies of this gadget along the blue torus. And when I do the fiber sum, each of these negative two self-intersection spheres opens up at a disk and I glue two together. And so I will get four self-intersection negative four spheres in that fiber sum manifold. And in fact, John Ettenheyer showed us that if you take that uh, L4 negative one lens space, that that was the boundary of a rational ball. So we could cut out each one of those spheres and go in a rational ball cutting the homology down a little bit. That's the rational blowdown principle of Finchel and Stern. And there's a method to compute the Donaldson invariance for those rational blowdowns. Alternately, when you do these constructions and you take cycles, you're gonna get Lagrangian spheres, which you can perturb symplectic spheres. You can make all of this happen in a symplectic world, if you like. Bob uh, described this in his new constructions of symplectic manifolds paper back in the 90s. This really is just out of there, but drawn with a little bit of extra care to 
keep track of where some things live. In fact, you've got an extra torus that's not happening near the fibrosome. I can fibrosome on an extra copy of E1, and that builds a special manifold that we need that I'll call V. So now, like I said, we're doing plain Jane. You know, these are old school constructions from the 90s. No engineering, no breeding. Uh, so we're just at a meager bone soup is what our construction is. And so to describe what this is, is in order to get a high rank um, sum and, we're gonna sum on as many copies of the K3 surface as E2s, fiber summing together, just you know, along the common T2, which we have that T2 that I showed you off to the left side that was disjoint from everything. And each one of these has an extra torus in it because it had two tori. It was the torus off to the left plus the blue torus. Um, so I could sum along the torus off to the left and I still have the blue torus, which is there if I want to do a log transform on one of those things or not. Um, we will have the manifold Z0, which I didn't tell you what Z0 is. Um, so let me go back up a couple, whoops. Z0, this is the blow up of K3. If I take this and I add it to CP2 plus two CP2 bars, um, that's the manifold Z0. That's really where our, um, family of spheres is going to exist. And so this K corresponds to, if we're looking for an element in pi K, in this picture, I'm showing the picture for what would happen if you're doing the even pi Ks, but we could do other ones as well. Um, then the point is that when we just did the naive computation just with the different Ks and Rs to get to different homotopy uh, um, groups, you had to change the topology of the manifold. It would be nice to change the topology of the manifold without um, increasing the size of the family of maps. And so the manifold that I described on the prior slide with all the vanishing cycles and rational blowdown is this manifold V. If you do enough fiber sums with V, doing adding one of these things on has the effect of adding two of these Z knots as far as the homology of the manifold. And since you're doing a fiber sum and fiber sum plays nice with the Donaldson invariants, you're not going to kill your manifold, your invariants by adding those on. And this is why you're able to get um, one manifold that has this exotic behavior in many homotopy groups. By the way, to get the um, high rank group, we can go back to old school stuff. This is a result from the gumpf morotka irreducible manifolds need not be complex paper. And what they showed is what happens if you do a log two transform, you know, a multiplicity log two transform on a torus in the K3 surface. And when you're computing these degree zero Donaldson invariants, so you're just counting ASD solutions. Um, it depends on a choice of a bundle, which is specified by different characteristic classes. And the relevant characteristic class that you will look at, which is an integral list of W2 of the bundle, um, if that is Poincaré dual to the um, If that's Poincaré dual to the um, section where you're doing the log transform, you're going to get zero. If it's not, you get two. Am I saying that in the right way? It, it's one or the other. Um, yeah. Let me, let me move, you know, the theorem statement here is correct. The point is this gives you a way of making things either zeros or twos, depending how you uh, put in, how you pick 
your bundles relative to where you've done log transfers. And so let's describe the diffeomorphism at the pi zero level. So at the pi zero level, we're going to just do two copies of that diffeomorphism F, one for, based on the sphere that you construct using the sphere on the left when I did the bunded, banded unlink, and one that we construct using the spheres on the right when you use the banded unlink, and you put an inverse on one of those. And that's this diffeomorphism alpha zero lives in pi zero of diff zero. Um, one thing that you can see just by quoting Friedman and Quinn, it's not too bad if you're going to quote Friedman's big theorem, is that this diffeomorphism is in fact topologically isotopic to the identity. In fact, you can also show that it becomes smoothly isotopic to the identity after you take a connected sum with the identity map on S2 times S2. Um, we did this in this 2013 paper where we just constructed explicitly the isotopy. And then when we finally wrote the paper, we took away the exact pictures and showed just sort of a lemma where once you generate a tube, you can kind of move the tube around however, however you like, which a little bit foreshadows the magnificent work that David Gabay did looking at tubes and following regular homotopies, which in fact led to a pretty general theorem that one is enough to make uh, surfaces isotopic after one stabilization. So now we want to upgrade this element of pi zero to elements of pi one, two, three. And to do that, we're going to have to upgrade the underlying manifold. So here's how we upgrade the underlying manifold. We just do a recursive construction. Z0 is Z0. Z1 is a fiber sum of two copies of Z0. Along that purple torus that I showed you that was the ciphered surface for the trefoil on that very first slide, which was a complicated picture from essentially Gumpf and Stipschitz, just drawn so we could see the trefoil lot in it. And then you just keep adding Z zeros. And each time you do that, you're going to get a manifold that's suitable for um, attaching one of these things. Remembering that Z zero was essentially a blown up elliptic surface plus this N, which is one copy of CP2 and two copies of CP2 bar, which in fact is equivalent to S2 times S2 plus a CP2 bar. And so one of the big points are that when we add on by a fiber sum over here, a copy of Z0, that's fiber summing an S2 times S2 connected sum something. And I can take the five S2 times S2 connected sum end, and it doesn't matter where which side of the fiber sum I put it on. So I can put it on over here, which means that the k-dimensional family of diffeomorphisms that I had on ZK will stably contract once I connect sum the S2 times S2, and that's going to allow us to build a K plus one dimensional family. I'll show you the formula here, uh, but then it will look at it with a picture. And so basically, it's just take commutators, you know, the usual phi, phi, phi inverse, uh, uh, you know, ordinary font phi inverse, um, where we're using one map based on the smooth contraction after you take a connect sum with S2 times S2. And if I want to construct the new family of diffeomorphisms, I just uh, take the um, commutator where I'm just using the alpha zero diffeomorphism in the Z0 factor. If I want to do the topological contraction, show you that this family is going to be trivial in the homeomorphisms, I just do the commutator with the topological contraction. If I want to know that the family we construct becomes trivial after taking an extra connect sum with S2 times S2, I'm just contracting over here. So in order to see that this is well-defined, We'll look at a picture instead of those formula. 
Um, I'm reminding you the top formula, which is the formula for the diffeomorphism. This is how we get the K plus one dimensional family out of the K dimensional family. But after we build the bigger manifold, the K dimensional family contracts and F is that smooth contraction. And since it's a smooth contraction, that means that at time zero, when I stick in the zero parameter over here, that's just the identity map. So all of this can be collapsed to a point. And this is in the homotopy group. So the base point all the way along is, can get contracted to a point. So the only thing you need to do is see what happens at time one. And at time one, this thing was the k-dimensional family plus the identity on v0. So when I'm looking at the um, next one up, I guess this probably should have been an alpha k plus one typo, that I'm getting the family on the left-hand side um, and the commutator with the identity on the left-hand side. It's uh, the identity on the right-hand side here and it's my new diffeomorphism on the right-hand side. Well, this diffeomorphism commutes with that identity. This identity commutes with all of those diffeomorphisms. So these two diffeomorphisms contract, and this contracts, which means that this is a spherical family, which we need a spherical family if we're gonna do something more than have, say, a toroidal family, where the toroidal family will say is something's funny at some homotopy group, but doesn't tell you which one. So this uh, makes us see specifically that we're in the K, K plus one, you know, these uh, manifolds that we get. So the invariant that we get is gonna be, we define the ASD moduli space, so connections that are anti-self dual mod gauge. And then given a family of diffeomorphisms, we pick a family of metrics that satisfies this property over a suitable bundle, and we count the solutions in the moduli space. If the bundle is chosen properly, the whole parameterized moduli space will be zero dimensional. This is much better said in a picture. So here's the picture. Uh, so, David? Yes. So just to then just to really double check, I think you clarified this at the very beginning. The these uh, reflection homomorphisms fix your principal bundle to define this moduli space. Yes. So well, okay. So we we need to be a little careful. Um, just yes. to see where Cyborg Witten would fail here. Right, because they don't uh, fix the spin C structure. Yes, that's exactly the point why Donaldson theory is easier with this construction than cyborg Witten. But, but just rephrasing that would mean that these reflection homomorphisms are defining, do they ultimately cook up into some automorphism of the principal bundle? Um, it's not that we're cooking up. So because I'm composing two of these things together, the uh, you know the alpha zero um, is a diffeomorphism that's topologically isotopic to the identity, and so this is just happening on the base, and we're just doing the pullback. So I'm going to fix one bundle. Let, let me show you where we use uh, the diffeomorphisms in the family here, and we'll see as we go on, and we can talk about it a little bit more after we finish. Hopefully, I'll answer a little bit as we look at this. So I'm now trying to construct an invariant for a family of diffeomorphisms parameterized by theta lives in a k-dimensional sphere. In the picture, it's just the one sphere. And so I start out by picking a family of metrics, a generic family of metrics parameterized by the sphere. And then I can pull back each of those metrics by the corresponding, by the diffeomorphism for the same point on the sphere to get another metric over here. And since the family of metrics, since the space of metrics is contractible, I can fill this in and get a spherical shell of metrics. And then for each metric, the ASD equations depend upon the metric. I can solve the ASD equations. Most of the time there'll be no solutions, but at a finite number of points, there will be solutions. We count those points with plus and minus sign. And that's the invariant, that's the pi K 
the movie hero Donaldson in Dread. For the homology theory, we have very much the same picture, but instead of a sphere, we've got a cycle. Here I've drawn just a one cycle, which a one cycle is just a sum of constants a, k times um, singular smooth simplices, uh, map sigma k mapping a simplex into the space of diffeomorphisms. So we take each one of those simplices times an interval. We pick a reference metric on one side. We pull back by the diffeomorphism to get new metrics on the green side, fill in using the fact that the space of metrics is contractible. And then we count the number of solutions in this moduli space and take the sum of those weighted by the coefficients of the homology chain. And that gives you homology invariant. If you want to know that the invariant is well defined, you do a usual cobordism uh, argument. So, given one spherical shell of metrics and another spherical shell of metrics, um, I connect the inner reference metrics in a family. I take the outer ring and get that as pullback from the inner ring by the Elmiumor by the um, Diff family of diffeomorphisms, and then I fill in uh, the roll of toilet paper to get all of the metrics and solve the ASD equations, and I get something one-dimensional, so the total number of boundary points is zero, and I notice that the points on the inside are related to the points on the outside just by a diffeomorphism, and since the moduli space is um, invariant under orientation, homology orientation, preserving diffeomorphisms, we get the same uh, number of solutions on the inner side as the outer side, they pair up, and this shows that it's well-defined. Stacking two of these roles, one inside the other, proves that it's a homomorphism. If we're going to get invariants for embeddings, well, we're going to get our invariants for embeddings just by converting families of embeddings into families of diffeomorphisms. And so the way this works is you might think of this as a parameterized blowdown. Um, so if I pick a homology class to specify the, or homotopy class to specify the um, component in the space of embeddings, if I pick this to have self-intersection plus one, then I've got a family of plus one spheres inside my manifold, which I can think of my manifold as just a trivial spherical family. Um, I can take another trivial spherical family, just uh, the sphere times CP2 bar. And a way to blow down the two sphere in CP2 to generate C4 is to take the fiber sum of CP2 with CP2 bar along the CP1s that are there. As long as the normal bundles of your spaces are orientation reversing equivalent, you can do this fiber sum or sub-manifold sum. So when you do this, you get another family of manifolds. This family of manifolds is not going to be a trivial family because this family of embeddings is not trivial. But a family of manifolds, so a bundle, a diff bundle over the sphere, corresponds to homotopy class from the sphere into the classifying space B diff, which corresponds to, by the exact sequence to uh, homotopy class one dimension down of the diffeomorphism group. And so that defines a map from embeddings to diffeomorphisms. Then we can use our invariant on diffeomorphisms to get a number out of this. You need a way of constructing families of embeddings, which <coughs> if you take a family of diffeomorphisms that become trivial after one external stabilization, and so you take the image of that um, thought of as a family of diffeomorphisms, that gives you a bundle over here twisted where this alpha is the clutching map where you glue the two disks together along the e plane. Um, taking this family and taking a uh, connected sum of this family along a point, just a similar sort of 
fiber wise connected thumb. Um, this is a twisted family initially, but because it's one stable equivalent and because the manifold in has an S2 times S2, this is a non-trivial, this is in fact a trivial bundle. So when you take the map of CP1 into the CP2 that fit here, and then follow it across by the trivialization, you get an interesting family of embeddings. When you compose these two things together, you're just doing a two blow-ups of the underlying manifold, and the invariants will play nice with blow-up, just like the ordinary Donaldson does. So <laughs> the remaining thing to tell you in five minutes, maybe go over a little, is how we compute the invariants. So to do that, um, Here's a minimum computational tool. If I'm given a family of metrics on X that we might be using to compute some invariant, and we're given a family of metrics on in the sum of projective spaces that interpolates between a reference metric and its pullback, then we can count the solutions in this parameterized moduli space versus the number of solutions that you get on X. And the answer is that on this side, it's four times bigger than the uh, count that you get over here. This, by the way, would just be the invariant of say our family alpha. And the way we're gonna do this is the old dog bone neck stretch argument, but in a parameterized setting. So the first thing that you wanna do is given a solution on X and a solution on in, you wanna show that you can average them together with a cutoff function. And when you average together, you're not going to get a solution, but you'll at least get a connected mod gauge that you hope is going to be close to a solution. And if you're close enough, hopefully you can make this work. In order to analyze how this gluing is going to work, we're sort of assuming that we know everything that happens on X sort of by an inductive procedure. And we need to know what happens over in. And on in, we're looking for anti-self-dual connections in a certain bundle. This is good. We're going to, in fact, be able to zoom in and just look at abelian connections, just reducibles. And those we can figure out just using homology. So we can define a natural quadratic pairing on the uh, second cohomology of in. And we've got one positive mode and two negative modes. And if we pick a homology orientation, that's just picking a class that it, uh, has um, lives in H2 plus uh, to declare that that's the positive direction. We can in fact then, given any metric, pick a unique uh, self-dual harmonic form um, that has norm one and, oh, this should say positive. Um, you know, and it should agree with the homology orientation. So once you get that, you can define the wall is going to be the set of second cohomology classes that um, pair with a certain class C to give you zero. These Cs are going to be term classes of the line bundle corresponding to the reduction. And what this is picking out is it's picking out when you're going to be um, anti-self-dual, because perpendicular to self-dual will be anti-self-dual. So the picture that you get is when you're looking at H2, it's three-dimensional with one positive mode and two negative modes. So it kind of looks like a two plus one dimensional space time. And saying that your omega G has square one means that it lives on this hyperboloid of two sheets. Saying it preserves the homology orientation means it's on the upper sheet. Saying it's perpendicular to the first turn class means it's perpendicular to a plane. You can radially project this all down to the disk, which is the Klein disk. You get a bunch of lines in the circle over here corresponding to the turn classes but there's only two of those lines you can compute between your reference connect omega and the pullback of the reference omega by F. Each time you cross one of those lines, you get a full two sphere worth of solutions. Doing this a little bit quickly, what happens here is 
Um, the two sphere, it's natural when you're going to glue to fix one point in the bundle and look at the framed moduli space. And when you look at this, you'll see an SO3 kind of corresponding to the gauge transformations remaining acting on just that one frame. And the stabilizer of the reducible connection is SO2. So you're seeing an SO3 mod SO2, which is a two sphere. Another thing that's worth pointing out is you can identify explicitly because it's just algebraic topology what the co-kernel is and how the stabilizer group acts. And then that acts just as the fundamental representation of SO2 on that co-kernel. So what this tells you is um, that the picture of the gluing formula if uh, you know I've suppressed, I'm doing a spherical shell, the I direction is coming in and out of the plane. So this is like the top view of a roll of toilet paper going down the tube is giving the invariance we're counting. These light, uh, these neon purple points are the points you're counting in the solution on X. When we add on this in and we're making this family, each one of these things is gonna be crossing the walls and it'll cross two walls algebraically. It might cross geometrically more than once. Each one of those picks up a whole sphere of solutions, but those aren't, so those can't extend to solutions on the glued manifold because there's an obstruction uh, and the obstruction corresponds to a section of the co-kernel. And so that's in fact isomorphic to just a vector field on the two sphere. And we know that if you count the zeros of the vector field on the two sphere, you get two points, um, you get two zeros for an arbitrary. So the way that number four in our gluing came from is it was two walls on in between F and the F pullback and two points for each planet. So this solar system gives a nice icon. Um, I don't know if people want me to go for an hour and so go for another eight minutes or stop here. Of course, I can't really stop you from bugging out if you want less, but. Are there any thoughts or shall I, go, I have a little bit more? I would keep going. <laughs> okay, so I'll keep going for another eight minutes. So let me describe, and this is just sort of, you know, it's like a nice school down from the RGI in Utah in 91 when we were all kids and uh, Donaldson Cronheimer came out and we were all pouring over that book. We're basically adding the word parameterized to the gluing job. And so there's a lot of symbols on this page, but the concept here is pretty simple. If you have a smooth map, and if the derivative is an isomorphism, then locally the map is a local diffeomorphism. This is the inverse function or the implicit function theorem, which you prove by a fixed point contraction argument. Um, in our case, the map that we get, the parameterized anti-self-dual equations, which I could call capital F, A is not a surjective map when you take its derivative. Well, there's a standard fix to that. You add the co-kernel to the domain, and you just think of the inclusion of the co-kernel plus your fields going over into, from the co-domain, from the domain into the co-domain. And as soon as you add in the co-kernel with its inclusion, that makes this map, the linearized map, an isomorphism. So it will have a right inverse. And then when you try to solve the equation that I comma F is of something, you know, turns out some point to give you zero, you can do a Taylor expansion of X where you'll get, of F, you'll get the constant point, the linear terms, and higher order terms. When you write the thing you're plugging in in terms of the right inverse, the linear terms in that right inverse cancel out to just give you a term omega, plus you get higher order terms, which are at least gonna be small in a small neighborhood. So you can solve for an omega, such that omega equals phi omega using the contraction mapping principle, which means that solving your problem is essentially dealing with this piece over here. This piece over here, which is the part that lands under this right inverse in the co-kernel, 
is exactly where the obstruction map comes from, because this depends on where you glued. And when you look at where this happens to live, luckily all the algebraic topology tells you it's in a two-dimensional vector space with weight two in the standard bundle of frames over the two sphere. Oh yeah, it's just, uh, it looks like a tangent bundle. So this is where you get that vector field sign that comes up. Um, of course, when you're doing a contraction mapping principle, you know what kind of estimates to prove. That at least shows that given solutions on the left, you get solutions on the right. You need to know that you get all solutions on the right. So to do that, you have an, uh, first an approximate splitting argument. And so the approximate splitting argument shows that if you have a configuration of connections mod gauge that's close to the image of the approximate gluing map, then there's a gauge transformation and sort of an approximate glued together representation and a glued solution so that you can get to your point that's close um, using this right inverse that you use so that the right inverse is, you know, implicit function theorem only defined in a small neighborhood. So once you get in that neighborhood, life is going to be good. This, in fact, means you're solving another PDE. If you look carefully at this, the gauge transformations is going to be a U inverse DU. You multiply by U to get rid of the U inverses, and it'll look like a DU plus, you know, quadratic stuff. This particular system of differential equations, you solve via the method of continuity. So you look at a solutions R, where at R equals zero, it's easy to solve it because you just get the point, A, you know, theta a at r equal, which is its own solution. And then you just need to show estimates, show it's open and closed. You get one a priori estimate. And the estimates are just, you know, basically follow Donaldson and Kronheimer, plus notice that you're using compact families of metrics. So you get bounds on the compact pieces automatically. This pairs together with a compactness argument to show you that the gluing map is subjective. Basically, you imagine that no matter how long the neck was, it wasn't surjective. Then you would get a sequence of solutions that wasn't in the image of the gluing map. Um, we're in a situation uh, where we pick the bundle so that the energy is sufficiently small, that the moduli space is compact. So these things would converge to a solution that'd be converging to a solution on X and a solution on N. And so that would mean that once you got far enough and close enough to that end, in fact, you were in the small region in the neighborhood of the gluing where the prior page worked. And so that combines together to give you the, a um, gluing map that I said with the moduli spaces on the prior page. That moduli spaces on the prior page is enough to give you this formula for invariance. And to show that that's true, we need to look at the metrics that you would satisfy for these families of metrics. I'm going to flash these next slides down pretty quickly because we're running short on time, but you can look on GTV and read them more slowly with a cup of tea and digest what's happening. We're just checking that this does what it's supposed to be. And so we pick a family of metrics uh, to compute the invariant for a family of diffeomorphisms alpha. And we're going to pick it so that the initial metrics are constant and don't depend upon the sphere which we can do by the suitable transversality argument that just barely works and does enough for this case. And so then we pull back, and this is exactly the family of metrics that you would use when you're computing the invariant over alpha. Now we're imagining that F is a smooth contraction once we add on in S2 times S2. It's even there once we add on a little bit more. And as usual, we're letting uh, the G on N be the family parameterizing between the fixed metric and the pullback by F. Then I claim that the family of metrics that you would use for the next uh, you know, family up for this family of maps is going to be this thing here. And so this means that if I do this at time one, that that should be the pullback of this at time zero by the map. So we need to know what it is at time zero. 
at time zero, you know, at S zero, we just plug in S equals zero and we just get this family of metrics. There's a typo that Z should be X, switching location back and forth. And then you need to see what happens when we pull back at a later time. We notice that with the contraction, when you put in time one, instead of getting the identity, you have the map alpha and then the identity. And G uh, at one is just the alpha pullback. So that means that the F inverse pullback of this thing is the F inverse of one plus F pullback of G zero, because when I take the one, that is the F pullback of G zero which then I can insert an F and an F inverse here, does nothing. But this pullback is exactly how it switches its contravariant. This is exactly the family that we saw in the formula where we were doing the invariant. It's exactly this family here. And we see that this family of metrics satisfies the feature that when I pull it back, the reference family by the map, I get the map at the other end which gives us computation for the invariant when we're doing these conjugates. The invariants that we need to compute are not for conjugates, they're for commutators. And the thing that we should be sticking in the middle should be alpha zero. Well, alpha zero is a map of this form done along one sphere, along the right sphere, and a map of this uh, form where I do my F along the left sphere. But the product of conjugates is the conjugate of the products, and this is a homomorphism. So I can compute the invariant when I do the conjugate with an alpha zero by the homomorphism formula. And then when I want to get the conjugate, if I just stick on the extra alpha zero on the end, well, the alpha zero is a trivial family. And so that has trivial invariant and doesn't change. And this is why you can compute the invariant for the higher dimensional family. And this is an outline of what we said. We build commutators to construct new families of diffeomorphisms. We use the solar system in order to um, glue these uh, things together and compute the invariants for the K plus one dimensional family in terms of the K dimensional family. And our result is that these are not equal. In particular, the kernel from one to the other is large. All right. Yeah, let's all thank Dave for a great talk. Actually. Uh, yeah, questions. <laughs> is, there, is there any way to get rid of that four in the gluing formula? With the cyber gluten, that's pretty unlikely because, you know, so you, you could possibly get, knock it down to two. In fact, if you use twisted coefficients, instead of doing a two um, copies of the homology reflection, if you just did one, then you would get a two instead of a four. Um, but because you've got this weight two action, you're not, so you could cross just one orbit in your solar system by using twisted coefficients, but you would still be stuck with the weather on the planets, which would give you two zero spots uh, there. Um, this is one of the advantages with the cyborg Witten. So that's why we only get a finite index subgroup that four when we're looking at those diffeomorphisms that become trivial after stabilization. The cyber written, the weight in cyber written looks like, you know, a CP infinity, uh, you know, it's a weight one action. And so there you would expect to see, so if you use the twisted coefficients idea with the cyber Gwitten or bauer Feruda, that would knock it down to one. And that, because you would have an infinite number of potential spin C structures to look at for invariance, should show you that you get an infinite rank sum and in the kernel and that in that sum and all of the things become trivial after a single stabilization. But like we said, that's the next paper. We need to get this one out. Yeah, I also had sort of a silly question. So, uh, yeah, I mean, 
do you expect it to work at all or some cyber written version of the same argument yeah, to go yeah, through yeah. or is, is it just very, that it's very much i expect it to work and i expect we will get it this is completely analogous to what danny did back in 98 he first separated these uh, diffeomorphisms uh, with, that were not smoothly isotopic via Donaldson type invariant. Then he defined a cyber witten invariant that he was able to use for the positive scalar curvature results. And he defined a Donaldson type polynomial that you know the Donaldson type polynomial would also get you to infinite rank summands in this case. Um, so all of that should be done. And it's exactly porting Danny's second and third paper over into this higher homotopy case that's sort of a uh, next project. I'm not claiming that it's done results. You know, we, we don't know, but I'm very confident that it will work out. Yeah, I, I would, let me just sec, I mean, chime in. Uh, I think there's there's no, I mean, I think it basically just works. I mean, the, the, the issue about the, uh, about the cyber Gwitten invariant, as Dave highlighted, is that uh, the composition law is a little bit funky, but that's really more of an issue for the pi z in the pi zero setting. Um, you know, this this is sort of all the kind of local comp computation, in particular the sort of wall crossing um, thing that he that he outlined. Uh, that works. I mean, that works identically uh, the same. It's just it's just a, it's just sort of. I don't know what we've just been ungodly slow about writing. <laughs> <That's actually laughs> the, the real answer is, is that is, uh, and we we want to finish writing the one. So, 